one. Welcome to the candidate forum for the 17th district of the Illinois House of Representatives. This event is being recorded. I'm Sue Swearingen with the League of Women Voters of Glenview Glencoe. Please note that only two of the three candidates running for this office are here for this forum. All three candidates on the ballot for the 17th district were invited and formally accepted the date and time for this event. Candidate Yuso Yoon's schedule has changed and she is not able to participate. This forum is co-sponsored and co-produced by the League of Women Voters of Evanston, Glenview Glencoe, and Wilmette, which serve most of the area of the 17th district. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which neither supports or opposes candidates or political parties. Our mission is to encourage informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and seek to influence public policy through education and advocacy. We also take action on governmental issues for which positions have been adopted through member study and agreement. The League is hosting this forum because of our belief in the principle that while voting itself is important, an informed vote is ideal. As Thomas Jefferson once said, an educated citizenry is a vital requisite for our survival as a free people. Providing this forum allows citizens to become better informed about the issues facing our community here in the 17th district and better acquainted with the candidates running for office who once elected will be responsible for addressing those issues. I'd like to thank our candidates for their participation. We appreciate your willingness to share your thoughts and positions with the citizens of the 17th district so that they may make an informed vote on their ballots in this upcoming election. Before we begin, I'd like to point out some important upcoming dates related to the November election. September 24th, next week, is the first date vote by mail ballots will begin to be sent out. October 19th is the first day of early voting, as well as the first day secure drop boxes for those mail-in ballots will be available for in-person drop-off. November 2nd is the last day of early voting, as well as the last day to use the secure drop boxes. And November 3, of course, is election day. I also want to make you aware of a powerful tool provided by the League of Women Voters of Illinois. The Illinois Voter Guide is a 100% nonpartisan portal for all election information. With this tool, you have the ability to check your registration online, check your status, or register, apply for a mail-in ballot, find, and find your polling place location. The guide also includes comprehensive information for the candidates on the ballot in your precinct. The guide can be found at illinoisvoterguide.org. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Patty Lackman, who will review the rules of the forum before we get started. Patty lives in Batavia, outside the 17th district. As a league member for 20 years, she has moderated over 100 forums and has served in the positions of president and voter services chair. Patty currently holds the office of vice president of the League of Women Voters of Central King County. Patty? Thank you, Sue. Good evening. I'm going to give some information about the format of tonight's event. The names were drawn earlier to determine the order in which the candidates will deliver their two minute opening statements. Questions have been selected by sponsoring leagues and the moderator. I, as the moderator, may ask a follow up question at my discretion. Each question will be directed to all of the candidates. The candidates will be allowed up to 90 seconds to respond to a question. The candidates will respond to questions in alternating order. That way no one gets all questions first and no one gets all questions last. The candidates will be allowed up to 90 seconds for closing statements. Closing statements will be delivered in the reverse order from the, the, those of the opening statements. Statements and responses are being timed and countdown cards will be visible to candidates and the viewers. And now I'd like to have the candidates start with their opening statements. Mr. Kruger, 
Candidate Kruger, you have two Hi. minutes. I, I'd like to first uh, express my uh, deep uh, gratitude to the League of Women Voters, and I've been uh, a great admirer of the League. I remember when the League sponsored the presidential debates, and frankly, I wish the League was continuing uh, to do so. So I'm, uh, I'm indebted uh, to everybody's civic uh, activism here. Uh, this is a great opportunity and a, a very rare opportunity for the voters of the 17th district to break outside of the two party system that has stifled uh, political uh, growth and, and growth in political ideas. Uh, the Green Party uh, has an annoying habit of uh, being right about so many things. Uh, the Green Party uh, first conceived of the Green New Deal over a decade ago. The Green Party has been right about peace. The Green Party has been right about campaign finance. The Green Party has been right about economic insecurity. The Green Party has been right on so many issues. And so, um, unfortunately, and I want to make it clear that I'm uh, hard on the problem and soft on the people. So. I have no quarrel, uh, certainly no personal quarrel with any candidate in this race or any other race. But I have to point out that in a very similar fashion, as you will hear, uh, corporate interests will uh, extol the virtues of free enterprise. And the fact is that these interests really don't like free enterprise. They really like um, collusion. They like monopoly. They like price fixing in the same way the two party system exists to exclude political uh, debate, to exclude uh, diverse uh, divergent opinions. And that's why this forum is so important. And that's why my candidacy is such an opportunity for the voters. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Kruger. Candidate Gong Gertschowitz, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is State Representative Jennifer Gong Gershowitz. I ran for office in 2018 for the first time in the wake of the 2016 presidential election that fueled a wave of women who ran for office to defend the core values that our mother's generation fought so hard to achieve. I believe in a woman's right to have agency over our bodies and our lives. And I voted to pass the Reproductive Health Act codifying Roe versus Wade and protecting choice in Illinois, no matter who is in the White House or who is in the Supreme Court. I am the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants who fought deportation under the Chinese Exclusion Acts. And as Trump was putting kids in cages, I stood up as the only immigration lawyer in the Illinois General Assembly to introduce and pass three bills to provide humanitarian protections for immigrant children and access to justice for all immigrants in Illinois. I believe in science and as a member of the Green Caucus, I am proud to have a 100% environmental voting record from the Illinois Environmental Council. I co-sponsored legislation to put Illinois on track to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2050 through investments in green energy jobs with a focus on equity. My family knows the tragedy of gun violence, which is why I believe in common sense gun safety reforms. I co-sponsored the Fix the Foid bill to keep guns out of the hands of those who should not have them. COVID-19 has exposed deep systemic inequalities and a dangerously shallow safety net. People are losing their lives and their livelihood. That's why I voted to increase funding for public health, including $416 million for COVID-19 testing and fully funded unemployment for those facing layoffs and furloughs. We passed legislation to help our schools meet the need for expanded e-learning and increased protections for essential workers and first responders on the first line, front lines of this pandemic. Thank you. And now we'll go to question number one. And we'll start with candidate Gong Goshewitz. What is the biggest challenge facing Illinois? And what is your plan to address that challenge? Uh, well, we are facing uh, dual public health and economic crises in Illinois. Uh, deepened by the pandemic. Um, Illinois' financial uh, problems existed before the pandemic. 
Um, but like most states, we have experienced increased costs as well as um, a, a loss of revenue due to the pandemic. I voted to put uh, the fair tax on the ballot in November because I believe that taxpayers deserve a voice in how our, uh, how our tax structure works. And as a voter, I'm going to be voting yes, and here's why. I believe that a graduated income tax is the fairest and most sustainable way to address public education and public safety in Illinois. I think, frankly, um, it is unfair to expect a bus driver and a billionaire to pay the same, same income tax rate. And our reliance on property taxes to fund public education in our state has led to um, deep inequalities in our public education system, where the quality of a child's education depends on their zip code. I believe that we need to reduce the reliance on property taxes to fund public education in our state. And a graduated income tax would give us the flexibility to ensure that those who can afford to pay more are the ones who do and that we don't overburden the middle class. Thank you. Candidate Kruger, same question. From the perspective of state government, the budget crisis is the most urgent crisis facing the state government. However, the biggest crisis facing the citizens of Illinois in the 17th district is a tsunami of debt and defaults and bankruptcies that are about to hit our small business community and our professional class. And even though the 17th district is a comparatively affluent district, there are gonna be shock waves from the CARES Act. And the CARES Act was a um, almost a unanimous uh, giveaway to the wealthiest corporations and individuals in this country to the detriment of the people in this country. And not a single member of either establishment party stood up to oppose it. One actual, uh, actually one Republican from Kentucky uh, stood up long enough to make, uh, to make them actually call a vote. So the CARES Act and the tsunami of debt that's about to fall, I would amend debt collection practices. I would amend the mortgage foreclosure law. I would amend, uh, pass the California Rosenthal Act, which uh, uh, gives consumers more leverage and more rights with lenders. Thank you. Next question, and we'll start with candidate Kruger. What specific recommendations do you have for ethics reform in the Illinois legislature? So uh, I think that um, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has a pretty uh, comprehensive ethics package. I believe I'd support an analogous uh, legislation on the state level. Uh, the question is, and uh, when we get into the details of policy, my first question is, do we have the resolve do we have the resolve to pass ethics legislation or is it, will it be whittled away? And I remember when Governor Rod Blagojevich was elected and one of the first things he tried to do was to pass ethics legislation and the General Assembly uh, stifled him. So that was kind of uh, ironic the way uh, then Governor Blagojevich uh, 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 turned out. Uh, I think the policies are out there I think we need courageous leadership to pass those policies. But for a start, I'd say, uh, I'd say Senator Warren's is a, is a great start and she's a great uh, policy analyst and a great uh, thinker along, along those lines of public policy. Thank you. Candidate Gong Gershowitz. Yeah, well, I absolutely agree that we need comprehensive ethics reform in Illinois. And that's why I am among those who have stepped up uh, to speak truth to power and demand change. Um, I have signed on to a nine point ethics proposal with colleagues um, and we have now begun work with the House Democratic Women's Caucus on developing our recommendations for the Ethics Commission, which is a bipartisan commission working on ethics reform. I have been committed and very vocal about the need for change. Um, 
and I have stood up and uh, I and I think uh, walk the walk. Um, I you know I can go into details. You know the the contours of the proposals um, put forth by both members of the Illinois House and the Senate um, include the following things: prohibiting legislator lobbyists, stopping the legislator lobbyist revolving door, better defining who is a lobbyist, fuller you know more fuller dis more full disclosures of uh, outside income. But the bottom line here is that it's about transparency. It's about ensuring that voters um, and, this, you know, and, and the people have the information they need to know who has influence in government. To me, that is the single most important thing that we need to do. The Warren plan, I think, is a 100-point plan, um, relates to the federal government. And I agree that it's worth looking at that and seeing what we can borrow for, you know, for Illinois. Thank you. Next question, and we'll start with candidate Gong Gertrudez. How would you address Illinois revenue shortfall, especially in light of COVID-19, including plans to raise more revenue and how to prioritize spending? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I said previously, um, we have a, a choice to make on the November ballot, and that is whether or not to change uh, from Illinois' current flat tax structure um, to a graduated tax structure, which is what the federal government and the vast majority of states do. Um, I think it's important to remind everyone that Illinois has had a flat tax since 1969, I believe, when Illinois imposed an income tax, um, and that we are constitutionally mandated right now, constitutionally mandated to charge a billionaire and a bus driver the same exact rate. And when you just look at what state government does, you know, the, the two biggest buckets, once you uh, back out the above the line expenses, the two biggest buckets um, in our budget are Medicaid, which is healthcare for the poor, and education. Cuts to education over the last two decades have resulted in rising property taxes. The state has essentially two sources of revenue, sales tax and income tax. Property tax is levied locally by units of local government, like your schools, your municipal government, and it stays local. So we need to take a look at transforming the way that Illinois uh, derives its revenue and spends. Um, and I think this is a critically important step uh, towards modernizing our tax structure. Thank you. Kennedy Kruger. So that's all true. The problem is that the General Assembly has squandered their political capital with the voters by doing this over and over and over again and taking money and, uh, and uh, using our uh, promises to our state workers, uh, their pensions, and, and going in the hole. And the middle class and middle income people are terrified of this and opponents of the fair tax, and I support the fair tax, and I'm voting for the fair tax. They're not going to support it because they're scared to death, and they'll be fear mongered by the uh, by the other party. Now, the the problem is when they look at um, IllinoisSunshine.org and they look at the donor list for the uh, Illinois politicians, they're going to say, "Look who's really governing you." It's fossil fuels, it's pharmaceuticals, it's payday loans. And you can go, and I urge anyone seeing this, this uh, program to go to IllinoisSunshine.org and look at the history of, of donations to each one of these candidates. So that's our, our problem. And, and that's also the problem with ethic, because as long as we have a donor-dominated system, we're going to have ethical lapses. Thank you. What would your approach be toward fixing Illinois' pension funding? Kennedy Kruger. The, um, it, it's interesting because we're in, we're in uh, the Chicago area and we have the uh, economists at the University of Chicago and they're supposed to be the smartest in the world. And they actually um, deem to know how to tell other countries all over the world how to organize their economy. And yet somehow they're not able to do it in Illinois. So isn't that kind of funny? But um, you're asking an actuarial question. 
to essentially lay persons. So the representatives are mostly lay persons. That was what was so uh, great uh, and interesting about uh, uh, State Senator Daniel Biss is he was a mathematician and he actually could, had a sharp pencil and he could figure this out. But all of this is gonna be subject to collective bargaining. And in collective bargaining, you have economic components, you have a component of work rules, and you have a component of due process for union members. It is possible working with our, our uh, labor unions that we can come up with solutions, could be buyouts, could be early retirement, could be working later, uh, but it's gonna have to, the unions are gonna have to be involved and they're gonna have to, we're gonna have to keep our promise to Illinois state workers. Thank you. Kennedy Gong Gertrudez. Yeah, Illinois' uh, pension problem has developed over 40 years, and, and frankly, there just is no silver bullet. Several state Supreme Court decisions have held that the General Assembly cannot unilaterally reduce a benefit once it's already accrued. The bulk of our pension debt uh, really resides with Tier 1 pensions. And uh, the General Assembly passed Tier 2 in 2010, um, and all state employees beginning in 2011 are in Tier 2. Tier 2 has increased uh, employee contributions and has uh, significantly reduced benefits. In fact, uh, many have said that uh, Tier 2 is as low as we can go under the federal safe harbor provision. So, you know, the solutions are going to have to come um, from responsible financial management moving forward. For decades, uh, the General Assembly has failed to make its pension payment in full each and every year. I've only been in the General Assembly one term, uh, but it's something that I felt strongly about uh, in, in voting for the budget last year. I insisted that we make our pension payment in full, uh, that we uh, ensure that uh, our pensions, um, you know, we don't skip pension payment pension payments. And the other thing that's an important first step is to begin to consolidate some of these pension systems, which we did. Uh, we consolidated police and fire, and I think we need to do more of that so we can take advantages of, of economies of scale. Um, Next question. If the fair tax amendment passes, how would the additional revenue be spent? If it fails, what is your plan to address the state's debts? We'll start with Ms. Uh, candidate Gong Gershwitz. I'm sorry, so your question is how would I, I allocate additional revenue from the fair tax? Yes. Um, well, I, I would use additional revenue from the fair tax to do two things. One, uh, to pay down our, pen, you know, to pay pensions, um, and two, to invest in education. Education is, uh, a, you know, one of the, the most important drivers of our economy. It's also uh, core to our future. One of the reasons why um, we, you know, I, I personally think have seen, uh, you know, a drop in enrollment in, in Illinois universities over time is that we haven't properly funded them. Um, I would invest in higher education. I would invest in our community college, uh, colleges. Um, one of the things that uh, Mr. Kruger and I agree on is, is the need uh, to ensure that community colleges um, you know, are, are available to everyone um, and that everyone can afford to attend them. And one of the things that I'm working on in the House Progressive Caucus um, is evaluating the possibility of making our community colleges free. Um, we need to ensure that people have access to the education that they need um, to, to participate in our economy. Um, so these are the things that, that I would focus on, early childhood, education, and uh, getting our state back on the right financial footing by addressing our pension, our pension debt. Thank you. Kennedy Kruger. Well, the fair tax uh, really really has to pass. If it doesn't pass, there's gonna be terrible uh, regressive and more draconian cuts and regressive taxation. I also favor the LaSalle Street tax, which is a $1 tax on trades on our three uh, exchanges, which uh, the average contract is over $200,000. 
So a $1 or even $2 fee on those contracts would raise uh, significant revenue. And although I am against a, a flat regressive taxes, there are some activities that are so destructive and so toxic to the environment that I think they should be looked at and, and that is plastics and uh, disposable uh, packaging. So I, I would favor taxing that because we simply have to get away from that kind of behavior. Uh, I'm also frankly looking at um, the idea of the uh, what I call the diabetes tax. It's actually the sugar tax. It's what Tony Preckwinkle tried to do. And again, we see how a, a two-party system has these limitations. Uh, John Daly sabotaged the sugar uh, tax under the brunt of uh, avalanche of money from the soft drink industry and the sugar industry. And we have our most vulnerable communities have uh, diabetes at an epidemic rate and the public health cost is enormous. So I think this sugar uh, may very well be an appropriate uh, area to tax. Thanks. Thank you. Kennedy Kruger, what can Illinois do to create more jobs and support economic growth? I think making community college free at Illinois' uh, 48 community college is going to attract economic development and entrepreneurship. And I think we need to move toward debt free. We've already heard, uh, uh, heard uh, from both candidates that, that we favor that. When I say debt free, it doesn't mean that people can't engage in various forms of service. I think it, it would, it's a positive thing for young people to engage in service and to uh, lower the cost. And so when I talk about a debt free education, I would include uh, those options in a, in a transitional uh, uh, manner. Uh, to attract people, we have to in invest in human capital and, uh, and adding uh, trade schools, vocational schools, and coming up with the, the, reaching the conclusion that everybody doesn't have to go to college and it's not the only way uh, to progress as a state. We can uh, bring back uh, industry and this is where as a green, I can agree with Republicans when they're right, I can agree with Democrats when they're right, we should bring back manufacturing, we should bring back supply chain. You hear a lot of talk of supply chain since so many uh, of our contact uh, and our imports uh, uh, overseas have uh, undermined the security of our, of our country economically and even, uh, even strategically. Thank you. Candidate Gongerchowitz. Yeah, well, I believe that, uh, you know, in addition to investments in education, and, and I support that as well, um, small businesses are the backbone of our economy, and many of them are women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Um, they employ a significant number of Illinoisans, and one of my biggest concerns um, is that the pandemic has, has disproportionately impacted our small businesses. It's why I supported uh, $300 million in uh, grants, um, business interruption grants, the second wave of which was just announced today through the uh, DCEO uh, to help our small businesses here in Illinois survive and thrive. But even prior to that pandemic, I, um, I introduced House Bill 4823, uh, which would provide a small business tax credit worth $5,000 to small businesses that create new full-time jobs. Um, again, it's about focusing on employing um, people in our communities. And, and one of the things that I love about our small businesses here in our community um, is that the, you know, our, the owners are people who live and work uh, here in the district. Um, you know, they often you know, feature uh, products you know, made by local artisans, um, and uh, employ people who, who live here. So um, I would uh, increase funding for the Illinois Small Business Emergency Loan Fund, uh, the Downstate Suburban Small Business Stabilization Program. Um, and again, I support uh, the BIG, the big program with DCEO. Thank you. What would you do to identify and change Illinois laws that create disadvantage or disproportionate hardship or actual harm for state residents based on racial identity? 
candidate Gong Gershowitz. Um, yeah, well, this is um, one of the most critical issues of our time. Um, and I think, you know, I, I want to start by saying that I stand with my colleagues in the Black Caucus to address systemic racism and anti-Blackness in Illinois. And I stand ready to be an ally in the fight uh, to reform um, our criminal justice system and demand greater police accountability. Um, I am one of two Asian Americans ever elected to the Illinois House. And uh, my colleagues and I in the Asian American Caucus have hosted uh, conversations about race with our friends in the, in the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus to have conversations about what this means for us here in our community and in Illinois. Um, this week, actually, the, the Black Caucus is hosting subject matter hearings on the package of bills uh, that we hope to address in the fall veto session. Um, these hearings are actually going on uh, this week. They are open and available to the public and I would encourage everyone to tune in. Um, they have uh, introduced four pillars uh, upon which uh, bills uh, will be organized around and those involve criminal justice, uh, reducing violence and increasing police accountability, education and workforce development, economic access and healthcare and human services. Um, it's not only about police accountability, it's also about investing in communities, in black and brown communities that have been disproportionately left behind. Thank you. Candidate Kruger. You can't talk about race without talking about police. We can't talk about police without talking about militarism. And we live in the most militarized society on the face of the earth. And it's been going on for almost 20 years now. When, uh, and our soldiers, many of them become police. Most people don't know that the primary uh, officer responsible for George Floyd's death was a graduate of the School of the Americas. The School of the Americas is a US military institution that trains people in counterinsurgency. It trains people overseas to, to destabilize governments and to overthrow governments. Uh, we need to demilitarize our police. We need to demilitarize our society. And to do such, we need to, uh, and, and our military and police are racialized. And they're racialized because the people who we end up killing are black and brown people. We need to have a commission formed, and I have a proposal for an Illinois Commission on Reparations, Truth, and Reconciliation to be comprised of academics, attorneys, and experts in the field of human rights and civil and constitutional law. And we need to devise programs to pay back the great debt to the original debt to the people who built this country. And I am very, uh, very passionate about that subject and also about uh, anti-war generally, because I think it's one system, it's a closed system. Thank you. And I don't blame the police, by the way. I do not single out the police for blame. I think most of them do an admirable job. And, and uh, full disclosure, my son is a Chicago police officer and he's an honorable person, does a very good job, so. Thank you. And along that line, criminal justice reform is very much in the news and is a priority for the League of Women Voters. What are your priorities for making the criminal justice system more equitable and reducing incarceration in Illinois while protecting public safety? And you can go on with that, candidate Kruger. I, I think that uh, mass incarceration uh, can be dealt with by uh, releasing um, nonviolent offenders. It can be dealt with by the um, uh, maintenance of, uh, of, of, of bracelets and these type of arrangements. But we need to, uh, again, demilitarize our police force. We don't need to have uh, weapons of war, tanks and bombs and machine guns being used against American citizens. 
And to have that, we need to change perception. And we need to change the perception of the police as an occupying force and to change the police into a conduit to social services. The police should be, be first of all, named public safety officers and they should be a conduit to these, uh, these resources. So I actually applaud uh, modest uh, advances uh, on behalf of Republicans where under Rauner, I believe, incarceration went down a few points and uh, Trump did sign the First Step Act. But we need to get violent offenders out and we need to get them the economic support we, uh, they need in the form of reparations because guess what? The overwhelming majority of them are descendants from our shameful legacy of slavery. Thank you. Candidate Don Gertowitz. I also support criminal justice reform and believe that we need to uh, end mass incarceration in our, in our, not just in our state, but in our country. Um, it's why it, it is the, the primary reason, frankly, that I supported uh, the legalization um, of cannabis in Illinois. Um, in my view, uh, this was about social justice. It was about equity. Uh, we had utilized uh, the war on drugs to disproportionately incarcerate a shameful uh, number of our uh, black and brown communities. Um, and we are in the process now of working through, um, uh, you know, and this is part of the cannabis bill, which was the most equity centered uh, cannabis uh, bill in the country. Um, I, I focusing on uh, expungements um, so that uh, you know, somebody who was convicted of a nonviolent drug offense that under the current law would no longer uh, be criminal uh, does not have you know, essentially a life sentence of poverty uh, because of that conviction. You know, we know that, that expunging records um, leads to employment, um, leads to dignity, and um, frankly is all about, uh, about justice. And so um, I fully support efforts to make sure uh, that we complete the process of expunging records for those uh, whose offenses would no longer uh, be criminalized under current law. Thank you. Candidate Don Gershowitz, what is your position on qualified immunity? Uh, so you're talking about qualified immunity for police officers? Yes. Um, you know, this is something that I, you know, came up, you know, I, well, came to my attention mostly um, in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor. Um, and I, I frankly think that it makes sense um, to remove qualified immunity for, for police officers. Um, but this is something that, you know, I think uh, deserves more research. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, this, uh, among other reforms, is one that, that makes sense to consider. Other things I think that make sense to consider is uh, uh, giving the Attorney General uh, more authority to um, investigate police misconduct. Um, I think that we should also require a special prosecutor whenever there's a death involving law enforcement. Um, and I also support House Bill 4999, uh, which would make any police officer convicted of a felony ineligible to receive future pension benefits. Um, but like I said, you know, I, I think it's important um, that it, it is the, the Black Caucus that leads on these issues. Um, and so I'm interested in making sure um, that we have the opportunity in Springfield to consider the package of, of reforms that the Black Caucus has vetted and supported and believe uh, will make a difference um, in our communities. And so, um, you know, I'm waiting to see the details uh, and, uh, you know, then uh, we'll have a better idea of what we're going to be considering in committees uh, in November. Thank you. Candidate Kruger. Uh, on the question of uh, of uh, immunity, qualified immunity, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, if I didn't just toss in end cash bail was another and ending cash bail is a very important facet of criminal justice reform. Uh, qualified immunity when when 
when lay persons talk about that, they need to understand that we have three branches of government in our system and the branches are co-equal. And the issue of qualified immunity is primarily applied by the uh, judicial branch. And it stems from the idea of a, of a sovereign and the idea that states have, have this power and they are immune to suit unless they consent to be sued. So when police act as agents of the state, they are entitled to limit, limited qualified immunity. This is not Chris Kruger saying this, this is a part of our system of law. So, but each police officer is charged with knowing the law and each can be held fully accountable to the full extent of the law. The problem is that our courts are reluctant to do so. The problem is that, that they receive light sentences or, or, or negligible sentences. All of their disciplinary records should be transparent. It shouldn't be subject to FOIA. It should be online. All their disciplinary procedures, all their complaints should be accessed and we should have some blue sky uh, transparency on police misconduct. Thank you. What are your priorities for protecting the quality of air and water in Illinois? Candidate Kruger. I think, and this is again a case study, and I am a bit of a broken record because I'm going to continue to say that when the, when the uh, two establishment parties are donor dominated, donor uh, centered, organizations, they're not going to be able to do uh, any significant proportion of what they, I believe, fully intend to do, but they're not going to be able to. There's a substance that's in food packaging, for example, it's called PFAS, P-F-A-S, or another uh, in that same family of chemicals called P-F-O-A. They are in food packaging. And when you eat, and if you go to a carryout restaurant, and not just a fast food, but even an upscale uh, restaurant, you ingest uh, this material into your body. And like other types of chemicals, it doesn't leave your body. It accrues in your body, okay? And it's being found in Lake Michigan water. It's being found in landfill. And it's becoming what the industry calls an emerging contaminant. Parties can, can't do anything about it. We need to tax plastic. We need to, to uh, label PFAS. We need to stop taking money from fossil fuel and the industries that produce these substances. And we need to uh, count all the costs, all the hidden costs, economists call externalities, which are the costs of remediating toxins and remediating pollution from fossil fuel and the chemical industries. Thank you. Candidate Gong Gershowitz. Yeah, so I mean, I, first I want to address, I think the original question was, was related to air, air or, or, or climate. Um, and I think the, the single most important piece of legislation in, in, uh, in the General Assembly today to address climate um, is the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And I am a co-sponsor of the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Uh, which would commit Illinois uh, and put Illinois on a path to 100% renewable energy by 2050, would decarbonize our uh, public transportation center, uh, uh, public transportation sector, and uh, reduce uh, our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, separately though, um, I just heard this week actually about the, the PFAS um, contaminants in, in Lake Michigan um, and frankly in our water supply. The Illinois EPA announced today that they are, that they are uh, beginning an investigation into that particular issue. I have also uh, been the House sponsor of House Bill 4888, which is the Illinois Drug Take Back Act. Um, this is a bill that I've been working over a year on. Um, it has a broad coalition of support um, and I'm working to get it passed so that we hold manufacturers accountable for the entire product life cycle. It's an extended producer liability model where uh, the drug manufacturers that create the chemicals are responsible for their cleanup uh, through the product life cycle. Um, and I'm committed to getting all of those things passed. Thank you. 
How do you intend to help Illinois keep its promise to improve school funding continually under the evidence-based funding law, which is intended to end years of inequitable funding in Illinois? Candidate Gong Gershwitz. Yeah, so the evidence-based funding formula uh, was passed in 2017. Um, and and it, it is uh, um, only two years, uh, you know, um, uh, in, ter in terms of its implementation. And we've already seen that, it, that it's beginning to work, that the money is going to tier one, tier two school districts uh, that uh, are below adequacy. Um, and I fully support uh, funding the evidence-based funding formula every single year. Um, in my first term, we put 350 million additional dollars into EBF. Um, this year, because of lost revenue due to COVID-19, I fought to hold uh, funding flat to FY20 um, and make sure that we held schools uh, to their base funding minimum to protect gains that we have made uh, since 2017. And the, you know, we've had, like I said, we've only had two years of implementation of EBF, um, but we're finding that it's working, that it's actually getting dollars to the schools um, that haven't been funded to adequacy. Um, the thing you know, that's revolutionary about EBF is that it looks at the cost of educating the child. So for example, if a child um, is uh, ESL um, or lives in a, you know, in a community uh, that lacks resources, it looks at the cost of educating that child. Um, so I, I have been on the front lines of making sure that we continue to fund EBF and I will continue to do so. Thank you. Candidate Kruger. You know, the, the problem is how do you keep uh, the flight uh, from, the, uh, from the public uh, to the private schools? You have to rebuild public education and uh, I will I will frankly have to bone up on the EBF. It sounds like it's a um, uh, a good thing. Um, it, it worries me greatly that there are such uh, forces undermining um, public education and that, for example, the mayor in the town where I live, kids go to private school. The mayor of Chicago, the last three or four mayors of Chicago go to private schools. There, there is such a, a dearth of support for public education. And it's almost reversing what it is. It's, it's a resegregation. Brown versus Board of Education was the most important decision in the 20th century, arguably. And it, it held that people are entitled to free education and that segregating people on the basis of race had an automatic, had a de facto uh, a discriminatory effect. So we need to have economic diversity. We need economic rights. We don't need uh, uh, means-tested programs. We need economic rights. And an education beginning right now through community college and working to debt-free baccalaureate education has got to be a right for all Illinoisans. Thank you. In the area of legislative redistrict, redistricting reform, please explain your position on redistricting and should the constitution be changed to an allow to allow an independent commission draw to draw legislative boundaries? Kennedy Kruger. Uh, alas, alas, I have to say that there is no such thing as nonpartisan dis districting. Sometimes you have to agree even with your adversaries. And uh, there's a case called Rutan versus Republican Party of Illinois that was a uh, patronage case. And it was about uh, state uh, snowplow drivers getting fired when the wrong guy won the election or the wrong guy lost the election. And um, gerrymandering is, is loser talk. It is actionable uh, according to the Supreme Court only, and the Supreme Court just came out with a case very recently called Concerned Citizens. Each party, when they're dominant in a certain area, they're okay with it. And then when they uh, find themselves sliding, then they wanna uh, uh, have a, a so-called impartial, there is no impartial um, redistricting. Overt racial 
districting is unconstitutional and the Supreme Court will uphold it, will uphold challenges to it. But anything short of overt racial redistricting is, um, is just the part of the game of, of legislating itself. And uh, it's interesting that our own district divides my community, which is a historically black community, right down the middle. I live on Dodge Avenue and the west side of Dodge Avenue is in this representative's district, is in our candidate's uh, incumbent's district. The other across the street is in another district. It divides black and arguably dilutes black uh, political power in the uh, mm -hmm. Illinois General Assembly. So sorry, there is no way out of uh, partisan gerrymandering. You have to organize and, and win elections. Thank you. Candidate Gong Gershowitz. Um, I support redistricting for reform at both the state and federal level. Um, and in terms of federal representation, um, I think it, ha it should happen on, on a nationwide level um, so that uh, everyone's on the same you know, level playing field. Um, I have always been a staunch supporter of the idea that a voter should choose their elected officials and not the other way around. Um, how to accomplish this um, is, is, you know, one that has been a topic of much conversation, I know, uh, within the league. Um, and I know that there are also uh, competing proposals to accomplish this. Um, some have already proven unconstitutional. Um, so I think more work needs to be done to ensure a truly nonpartisan process, uh, rather than to sh simply shift responsibility to a committee that, that uh, is appointed by politicians. Um, if politicians are appointing the committee, um, I don't know that you're gonna truly have a nonpartisan process. And the other issue that I'm deeply concerned about is, uh, is protecting um, minority representation and not disenfranchising minorities um, in the, the map drawing process. Um, so, you know, uh, computers um, and computer models are also written by people. Um, so uh, it, it, to me, um, more needs to be done to look at how you would tr uh, you know, truly create a nonpartisan process. Uh, and I just don't think we're there yet. Thank you. As a lead, uh, excuse me, do you support the repeal of the Parental Notification of Abortion Act? Why or why not? Candidate Gong Gershowitz. Yes. Why or why not? Um, I, well, you know, this is um, to me just, you know, again, a question about fundamentally um, who should have agency over their own bodies and their own lives. Um, prior to coming to the General Assembly, I spent over two decades uh, representing women and girls in gender-based persecution cases. I handled one of the first child trafficking cases in Chicago. Um, and I have seen the devastating effects of women not having agency over their own lives. In my view, if we could legislate a parental relationship where um, a woman felt comfortable talking to her parents, um, you know, that might be a different story. My feeling is that you cannot legislate those things. And in my experience, in my experience, representing um, girls and women who have experienced trauma, if they cannot tell their parents, there is a darn good reason. And to take that woman's agency away from her to give it to somebody else, um, to me is, um, it's traumatizing, um, it's abusive, and it doesn't accomplish the fundamental underlying purpose for the, for the original legislation. Um, so to me, it causes more harm than good. Thank you. Candidate Kruger. It, it, it's a thorny issue, and if I understand it correctly, I, I, I read the ACLU position on it, the, the, the problem is that um, if, a, if a minor child is seeking an abortion and a physician touches that, that minor child, there's an there's a issue of her capacity to consent. And so that's the, that's the thorny issue. And a and physician could be sued. Physician could be um, uh, in trouble unless uh, a parent uh, was notified. 
uh, and um, my understanding further is that it's a notification, not a permission statute. So it requires notification. It doesn't require permission. Uh, so to me, it's, uh, it is a thorny issue. Uh, and uh, I fully support people having agency. However, there is an age of consent and an age of, of, of agency. So um, that's my position on that. And, and if it is the case that it's a notification statute and not a consent statute, I think it's, uh, um, I think we're kind of stuck uh, with, we do have parents and parents do have the right uh, before someone touches their child, before a physician performs a procedure on their child. Thank you. How well is Illinois doing managing the legalization of recreational cannabis, including protecting public safety and providing equitable opportunities for entrepreneurs to enter the business? Kennedy Kruger. Well, I'm quite sure that the, uh, that the uh, opportunities are not equitable, but maybe, I, perhaps I'm wrong, but I'm glad that um, a uh, older, older person in the city of Evanston has an initiative to uh, tax cannabis sales and to use that to remediate some of the effects of racism. And I support that conceptually. Um, there are legitimate social costs with the use of marijuana. People that use marijuana and full disclosure, I used to use marijuana. I haven't in uh, quite a few years. Um, there are uh, effects. There are people more likely to have um, a mental uh, neuroses and even psychoses. So there's effects and those effects should be addressed just like we do with alcohol, just like we do with tobacco. It's fair game uh, for taxing the social costs. Again, this gets back to the hidden costs uh, uh, or externalities I talked about in response to another one of your questions. So uh, cannabis is, is adult stuff. It's serious stuff. Uh, it should be recreational. And uh, it's preferable, I, I suppose, to people taking opioids because the uh, opioid industry opposes legalization of marijuana. So if the pharmaceutical industry opposes it, it's probably a good thing. So we need to tax it to remediate the social costs of people who, uh, uh, who run off the tracks uh, using marijuana. Thank you. Kennedy Gong Gertowitz. Yeah, one of the reasons that I uh, fought to ensure that part of the revenue would uh, not only uh, go to uh, disproportionately impacted communities, um, I also fought to ensure that part of revenue would be dedicated to mental health um, and education. Um, like anything, um, whether it's alcohol, um, drugs, um, to me, the most important part of um, uh, you know, stopping abuse is, uh, you know, of, of addicted substances is, um, you know, or, or substances like marijuana that, um, you know, children shouldn't have access to. It's why it, uh, it's highly regulated. Cannabis is one of the most regulated industries that we have in Illinois. Um, and that is designed to ensure uh, that people who are underage um, don't have access to it. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, um, I've, I've got three kids. Um, I found that, you know, one of the most important conversations that we can have with our kids um, is, uh, you know, related to uh, the choices that they're going to have to make. Um, and so I support resources, you know, for uh, addiction and substance uh, treatment, for education, for mental health services, um, and equity. And I think part of the question was whether or not, um, you know, there are, are uh, you know, licenses um, being granted equitably. And I think we've got some work to do in that area. Um, I think Representative Cassidy has been following up on that and more needs to be done. Thank you. And now we will go to the last question on affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Do you support affordable housing? And if so, what would you do to make affordable housing a reality? Kennedy Gong Gertowitz. Yeah, so um, this is an issue that I've been working on with members of the House Progressive Caucus over the last year. Um, we had been working on a bill that would provide uh, you know, additional tax incentives to build 
uh, affordable housing and uh, resources to rehabilitate so that we maintain uh, the current stock of affordable housing. Um, and then some of that legislation got postponed because of COVID. Um, so we fought to ensure that there was mortgage and rental relief as part of the distribution um, in, in, in uh, our COVID appropriations. Uh, so there were three, $300 million worth of appropriations um, uh, for rental and housing assistance um, pushed you know, from the CARES Act you know, through uh, DCEO. Um, and, uh, and now we're focused on the next steps, which is uh, passing a bill um, that would piggyback off of the federal legislation, which provides um, uh, incentives uh, for building additional affordable housing. Um, and uh, it's a program that at the federal level is oversubscribed. I think that we could put resources here in Illinois to that effort, um, because what we need is more affordable housing. There just isn't enough of it. Thank you. Candidate Kruger. Well, first of all, let's raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour so people can afford uh, to, to, to pay for things. So we need to, you know, we've had a race to the bottom in declining uh, salaries and wages uh, over the past 40 years. But um, I've seen aspirational uh, housing statutes not work very well. Housing ordinances not work very well. I saw in the city of Evanston, the African American population has declined in the city of Evanston over the past decade. And uh, every time they would build one of these buildings, uh, they would they would begin with uh, figure X, and then it just go down and down and down. So these things have to be mandated. They can't be aspirational, and I don't and I don't think they can be. Uh, only incentives. They have to be mandated. People have to have economic rights, not means tested. They need to have a right to uh, a affordable housing. Uh, also, we should lift the ban on this terrible legislation. That's an ALEC. ALEC is a is a right wing think tank that drafts model legislation uh, in all the state legislatures. Uh, we have a ban on rent control, and we should lift the ban on rent control. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that, uh, uh, and, I, and I support that idea. But whatever we do, it can't be aspirational. Uh, the carrot doesn't always work. Sometimes you need to take out the stick, and I think that's what we need to do. Thank you. And now we'll go to our closing statements, and we'll start with candidate Gong Gershowitz. You're on. First, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And before I close, I did just want to say um, we did pass a $15 minimum wage. I voted for it in my first uh, session. Um, but uh, no, really, I, I just, uh, this has been such a pleasure to have the opportunity to be with all of you, um, to talk about our priorities, um, and, and, and I explain I, you know, our, our vision for the future. I ran for office two years ago to fight for the values that have defined my life and, and career. And it has been an honor of a lifetime to serve this community. I do believe that there is nothing that we can't accomplish if we're willing to work together I reached across the aisle to pass it, three immigration bills with bipartisan support, something that uh, people didn't think was possible. We are in this together. We are facing the most consequential election of our lifetime. Over the last two years, I've had the opportunity to lead on a wide range of issues, from lowering the cost of prescription drugs, which I put a cap on insulin, uh, to protecting our environment and our elections. And I'm just getting started. I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Candidate Kruger. You know, we've had a cordial, uh, a pretty cordial discussion tonight, and it really, it, you know, it's tempting to just stay on, on, on that uh, happy talk track, but, but the facts are we're not going to reverse climate change within the two-party system. We're not going to reverse the greatest wealth inequality in the history of what humankind within this two-party system. We're not going to be able to do it with elected representatives who are controlled by, by money and politics. Citizens United is the Plessy v. Ferguson of the 21st century. 
So Plessy v. Ferguson was the uh, decision legalizing segregation until we overturn that. And unfortunately, we can't rely on the judiciary to overturn it. We, the voters, have to overturn it. And we have to do it by rejecting uh, the, the two donor-dominated parties. Go to Illinois Sunshine, read the spreadsheet, see who's actually governing this state, and then you'll see. And, and uh, I think everybody here, I thank everybody here for their civil, civic uh, commitment and involvement. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm not supposed to be here, by the way, because historically the Democratic Party has done everything in its power to, to keep us out of the debate and out of the um, uh, election. So people have a real choice, a genuine choice this time. They should exercise that choice, especially in Illinois, where, uh, where we see such a history of corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll go to Susan Swearingen for some final comments. Thank you to our candidates, Mr. Kruger and Ms. Gon Gershowitz, to our moderator, to the League of Women Voters of Evanston, Glenview, Glencoe, and Wilmette, and of course, to you, our viewers. For further election information, consult the nonpartisan IllinoisVoterGuide.org which is powered by the League of Women Voters of Illinois. In these uncertain times, it's never been more important to make a plan to vote. Don't leave anything to chance. Whether in person or by mail-in ballot, your vote is your voice. Thank you.